Looking back at the October 1963 edition of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, we find an article written by Sir Bernard Lavell in which he describes his visit to the Soviet Union between June 25th and July 15, 1963. Lavelle says that the president of the Soviet Academy of Scientists, Mrs. Slav Keldish, put great emphasis on general technical difficulties of getting their cosmonauts back alive, and especially on the seemingly insuperable dangers of the radiation from solar flares that could quickly kill them. Sound familiar? Why shouldn't it? It looks as though the authors of Journey to Tranquility got their information from these papers that Webb shows. I'd like to take a moment to read this section in full. Keldish spoke with great enthusiasm of the plans to establish a manned optical observatory within five years to be put into orbit at a height of 100 to 150 miles and carry a 36-inch optical reflector, an astronomer and an engineer. The immense advantage of a telescope in space is, of course, that it is clear of disturbances and absorption of the Earth's atmosphere. The Americans have plans for unmanned orbital telescopes, but the Russians intend to exploit the space rendezvous techniques that they think they are on the point of mastering in order to have a manned observatory where the crew could work for spells of five to six days. There is also enthusiasm for landing instruments on the Moon's surface and on the planets as well. But when we turn to manned lunar landings, Keldish put great emphasis on general technical difficulties of getting men back alive and especially on the seemingly insufferable dangers of radiation from solar flares that could quickly kill them. The solar flare problem is manageable, the Russians believe, in the case of the orbital observatory because the few minutes warning of heavy radiation that is now possible would be sufficient to bring the crew down to a safe level. So it seems, Keldish told Sir Bernard that the Soviets saw the solar flares encountered on a moon flight being insufferable and could quickly kill an astronaut but manageable on a low earth orbit station. No surprises there, in low orbit, the effects of radiation are not felt as strongly below the Van Allen belts and within the protection of the Earth's magnetosphere. In his new book, Death from the Skies, Phil Plate writes on how the International Space Station carries a shelter for when major solar flares pop up. In a major flare, an astronaut could absorb hundreds of rems of x-rays. This can be fatal. There is simply too much cell damage for the body to repair itself. Over the course of several hours and days, the astronaut suffers a slow death as cells die. The intestinal lining slugs off, ruptured cells leak fluid into their tissue. The effects are horrifying. NASA takes these threats very seriously. When a flare is seen on the sun, astronauts on the International Space Station retreat to a section that is more protected, letting the station itself absorb the radiation to safeguard the humans inside. Four years later, in the November 1967 edition of that same journal, we find another article which discusses the letter that Lavelle sent to Dr. Hugh Dryden, then a NASA Deputy Administrator, following his 1963 trip. This article reiterates the three problems plaguing the Soviet lunar program, including that Soviet scientists could not see any solution to the problem of protecting cosmonauts from solar flare radiation. I could not find a scan of Lavelle's original letter, but a declassified CIA memo written eight days after his letter summarizes that the Soviet scientists had rejected any manned lunar landing missions for the time being because of 1. the hazards of solar flares, 2 the tremendous launch propulsion requirements, and three, the ability of unmanned probes to supposedly do everything people could do more cheaply and quickly. These three points are almost exactly what Jerry Source says, except that they substitute hazards of solar flares with lethal effects of solar radiation. Everywhere except in Jerry Source, the Soviets were concerned with solar flares back in 1963. I am not sure what Webb is getting at here. Is he trying to imply that the authors of Journey to Tranquility have taken Sir Bernard out of context? I don't see how. In his 1963 article, Sir Bernard said, Keldish put great emphasis on general technical difficulties, on getting men back alive, and especially on the seemingly insuperable danger of radiation from solar flares that could quickly kill them.
and the 1967 article reads, In a letter to the late Hugh Dryden, then Deputy NASA Administrator, Lavelle said the Soviet scientists could not see a solution to the problem of protecting astronauts from solar flare radiation. The CIA memo reads, Keldish claimed that Soviet scientists had rejected any manned lunar landing mission for the time being because of the hazards of solar flares. And finally, the book reads, The Russians could see no immediate way of protecting cosmonauts from the lethal effects of solar radiation. What's out of context? All four sources state the exact same thing, just worded differently. Sure, the authors of Journey to Tranquility didn't use the word solar flare per se, but no one needs to second guess what they are talking about. Solar radiation comes in two forms. Solar wind, which doesn't penetrate very far, and solar flares, which can penetrate centimetres to several metres of shielding. Three forms if we count the light we see. Of course, this was three years before the Soviets first tested the bearing strength of the lunar surface with Lunas 9 and 13, or flew Lunas 10, 11 and 12 around the moon to hunt for potential manned landing sites and actually make lengthy radiation measurements in the vicinity of the moon. Actually, Webb, this statement was made after Russia's earlier moonbound probes were sent, i.e. Lunas 2, 3 and 4, which measured the radiation in cislunar space. And I hate to correct Webb, but this concern still applied after Luna 10 was launched. Webb later criticizes my use of a BBC interview with Sir Bernard Lavelle, in which he tells us that his Soviet contacts were holding back on sending cosmonauts to the moon until they could be absolutely certain of getting them back alive. I had frequently asked my Soviet contacts when they intended to send um, a human being to the moon, and their response was always, when we can be absolutely certain of getting them back alive. And they did not believe uh, that the Americans would do this. And in fact, it's pretty clear that the Americans uh, did take considerable risk. Did Lavelle say anything about radiation in that statement? No. Did he say the Soviets thought it was impossible to send men to the moon? No. His Soviet contacts merely said they were waiting until they could be certain of getting their cosmonauts back alive. And just when did they tell him that? Well, if you watched the episode of The Planets that I took this statement from, you'll note that they told him this shortly after Luna 10 in 1966. You know, the one that was sent to make lengthy radiation measurements in the vicinity of the moon. Next came Luna 10, the first probe to orbit the moon. It beamed down the Internationale to the Party Congress. The Americans feared the next craft would carry a cosmonaut. But the Soviets were more cautious than they seemed. I had frequently asked my Soviet contacts when they intended to send um, a human being to the moon. And their response was always, when we can be absolutely certain of getting him back alive. And they did not believe uh, that the Americans would do this. And in fact, it's pretty clear that the Americans uh, did take considerable risk. Since, as indicated by Webb's own 1967 article, that there was still talk about what Keldish had stated in 1963, I think it's fair to say that Sir Bernard's Soviet contacts told him, Meh, nothing's changed, comrade. Did the Soviets say that the astronauts could not survive the radiation of deep space? No. Did they say that solar radiation was an absolute showstopper? No. Yes, they did. No matter how Webb wants to twist the words, it can't change the fact that Keldish told Lavelle that solar flare radiation was manageable in low orbit but not on a flight to the moon, and that they ultimately had to postpone manned moon flights indefinitely until they could solve the problem. In fact, even though Zonda 7 was considered flight-worthy for humans, the Soviet Union dismissed Alexei Leonov's pleas to fly it around the moon. The cosmonauts come up with a high-risk plan. We, cosmonauts of the Soviet Union, 
respectfully ask the Politburo to consider ordering the next circumlunar mission to be manned. We are ready to take the risk, whatever it may bring, to serve the motherland. This is our duty. They appealed to the Politburo for a man flight around the moon on the 7th of December. If successful, they will beat the Americans. At the beginning of December, the cosmonauts' request to fly around the moon is denied. Doesn't it seem strange that the Soviets would have to use Sir Bernard Lavelle as a messenger boy? Why didn't they communicate their concerns directly to the NASA administrators? Could their statements have been a ruse to entice the unsuspecting Americans to lower their guard? Weren't the Americans and Soviets supposed to be at each other's throats at the time? If so, why would it be strange that the Soviets asked a common friend to pass a message to the enemy? Or maybe they needed a fall guy in case they changed their minds, which they did, by the way. Keldish later denied what he told Lavelle, and Khrushchev went on to say that the Soviets were indeed working on sending a man to the moon when the time was right. So, they'll land a man on the moon when the time is right. What could that mean? This statement is pretty open to interpretation. Perhaps we should flip a couple pages back from where he's quoting. If we turn to page 228, we find... Sir Bernard Lavelle, director of Britain's Drodrell Bank Experimental Station, returned from a trip to the USSR in July 1963, and reported that the president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, M. V. Keldish, had told him that the USSR had rejected, for the time being, any plans for manned lunar landings due to the insurmountable problems of radiation in space. I'd say it's pretty clear from this that when Khrushchev says when the time is proper and our capabilities have been developed, he means when we have solved the radiation problem. You can see from this just how selective Webb is with his quoting. He skips right over a specific sentence like insurmountable problems of radiation in space and jumps to a vague one like when the time is proper and our capabilities have been developed and which he can then interpret in whatever way suits his argument. There's more of this to come. Webb released part two of his radiation response the next day. In it, he makes a number of claims, most of which I have already addressed in earlier videos. So please pardon me if the remainder of this video comes off as a flashback episode. The Soviets were masters of deception and misinformation especially when they wanted to hide their failures. Even though they may have denied that they were actively pursuing a manned lunar program in 1963, once the Cold War had formally ended in 1991, the rest of the world finally got to see the official government records and eyewitness accounts and discovered that the Soviets had a rather extensive manned lunar program. In fact, by the time Aldrin and Lovell flew the final Gemini mission in November 1966, the Soviet manned lunar program was well underway. This was already discussed in my Why Not Go Back series. There is another interesting factor to the old Soviet moon program. As we already established, the USSR had constructed their own version of the Saturn V, the N1. Understandably, the designing, developing, and construction of the Soviet and American moon rockets involved the efforts of thousands of scientists and engineers. And yet, the N1 itself was a well-kept secret in the Soviet Union for 30 years. 